This is making me laugh for some reason, thinking about reading this book to a camera. Let's get settled in here. Never Trust a Zombie by Paul Brody. It's this guy. All right. Let's try this out. Chapter 1. Small Town Trap. I can't believe I'm transferring schools again. My dad just can't seem to keep a job in the same place for very long. Thankfully, Mom works from home. She completes surveys online. She's a stable part of my life. Dad is a contract CEO. He's always gone, and we are always moving. Companies hire him to stabilize their business, and then after a year or so, he moves on to another job, and I move on to another school. He just doesn't understand what this does to me. He never understands things. There's nothing I can do about it. And here we are moving to Cranston, Texas, population 2,346. We've always been in larger cities, but my parents got tired of that, so they found a nice outlying village to hide away in this time. I'm leaving a high school with close to 5,000 students to live in a town with a smaller population. This is how I'll finish my public school career. A fitting swan song, I suppose. Mom, why did you guys choose Cranston? Oh, I don't know, dear. It just seemed like a nice change of pace after the last few years of urban living. The only downside to Mom's survey job is that she doesn't pay much, pay much attention to me when she's working. But you love the city. What are you talking about, change of pace? Mom loves the city. She doesn't want to change pace. Well, sometimes it's nice to do something different. Dad likes to change his job often. He likes to change our house often. I suppose he likes to change our living style often as well. I'm a teenager. My lifestyle changes all the time without changing my environment or affecting anyone else. Why can't Dad change like that? I don't think I'd like that. And by the way, your constant changes don't affect anyone else? Oh, Mom, forget it. I don't like being shown up like that. You'll be fine, Eric. You never have trouble making new friends, and you've never lived in a simple town before. I think you'll enjoy the, sp the slower pace. I guess we'll see. I'm going to my room. In parting, I say, sure, Mom, I'll make new friends, and I probably won't even have to try to keep up. I probably... Ah, here we go. I can't read. <laughs> and I probably won't even have to try to keep up academically with these bumpkins. But still, I'd rather not be here. Am I supposed to, like, say, like, if it's in quotes or not? I can read it, so it makes sense who's talking or who's thinking. I don't know how to do this. I guess we'll figure it out. Now, this part's got one of those, I put three asterisks in to indicate a uh, change of scene, I think, is what I was trying to do there. I probably never did it again in the rest of the book. <sighs> Back to the book. I'll try not to cut out like this too often, but I'm. Uh, this is making me feel anxious to do this and uh, feel like this is the most uh, poorly written thing ever, so I have to express this to get past that we'll, we'll continue on up in my room i check out my new textbooks we arrived in town on thursday on friday mom took me to the school to register for classes and get my books i'll start classes on monday starting a new school is always somewhat difficult for me but it's made worse when it happens in january like this time three times we've moved over the summer so i was able to start the school year fresh with everyone else i was still new and didn't have friends from previous years but at least i wasn't dropped into the middle of school of middle of social conversations lasting since september not that it's much of an issue for me. I don't date much, but dropping in halfway through the year is usually a hassle for that kind of thing. Everyone is paired off by January, and in a school with such a small population and an even smaller senior class, I think the lady at the school said 38 students. The chance of me finding any girl to interest me is slim to none. I'm just going to do my time, graduate, go to college far away, and finally be able to settle down somewhere I choose. No more of this nomadic living like a criminal or storybook monster. Dad is already full... Dad is already fully involved with work, meaning he's not around on Saturdays either, so it's just me and Mom for dinner again. We decided to try out one of the local barbecue spots. Apparently, there are two things Cranston is known for, very little rain and a whole lot of barbecue. We have a small, quaint is the word my mother used, three-bedroom ha ranch house. No ranch, just the house. But down the road away, after it forks, the ranch land begins. Our house isn't far from the center of town, a few city blocks is all. We live on Earp Street. It's a left onto 1st Street, and that crosses over and continues on past Route 33, which is called Main Street, for the quarter mile it runs through town. It's primarily residential between home and town. The only commercial buildings in town are all on Main Street. The school, which houses kindergarten through 12th grade, is on the other side of Main Street, heading away from our side of town. Not more than a mile straight line from our house, roughly, but given the roads to follow, it probably comes out a little longer. I plan on riding my bike to school, at least until the heat picks up again. I hear it spends most of the year in the 80s and for the thick of the summer, it tops 100 quite regularly. Once it gets to that, I can use the car. If mom doesn't need it, or as she keeps suggesting, I'll be able to ride to school with my new friends. I think she already thinks I have a solid group of friends here. I haven't even seen anyone my own age aside from our short visit to the school for me to get my class schedule and books. 
I just love all of these local businesses. No sign of franchise stores anywhere. Mom seems to be genuinely happy in this desert wasteland. I guess that helps me feel like being here isn't a complete waste. I thought she always catered to what Dad wanted, but maybe she had some influence in this decision after all. Yeah, looks like stereotypical small-town America for sure. As much as I want to be under protest with this move, I guess I am kind of interested in a dramatically different location, and I do like barbecue. I really don't need to make a lot of friends to feel comfortable here. I can get by without all that social stuff, but it would be nice to find one person I can relate to and goof off with. I'll know better come Monday. We pull up to Josie's Barbecue and breakfast to find what seems like half the population of Cranston parked outside. Okay, that's a total exaggeration, but the place looks packed. I told you we should have just walked over. Mom thinks it is stupid to drive the few blocks when it is such a nice day and in January to boot. We were in the frozen north before I moved to Texas, living just outside Chicago where Dad was working. I don't mind the snow very much, but I'll admit I'm pretty excited to have winter over with already. Yeah, yeah, you told me so, I say. I guess I'll turn around and park on the other side of the street. We'll be halfway home already. Mom knows how to make her point. If you guys hadn't wimped out and just bought a ranch there by completing the Cranston experience, we could be having our own barbecue out back, right after we slaughter our own steer. Right, like you would slaughter anything. I'd like to see that and laugh at it. Mom is right. I don't exactly have the constitution of a slaughterhouse technician. I tried pulling a conscientious objector role for biology class when we did the frog dissection unit. It didn't work, and neither did my body when I had to pull the guts out of that little guy. I passed out. That was the one time I actually looked forward to an upcoming move. I was the only one to faint, and the teacher made sure to let us know that that was the first time he'd ever had a student faint during a frog dissection. Lucky for me, he waited until I came too before making the announcement to the class. The jerk. Well then you could do the slaughtering and I could do the grilling. Just thinking about the frog incident again makes me feel a little uncomfortable in the upper digestive system area. Look over there, mom exclaims with an over the top extension of her index finger. What? I follow the finger to the eight car parking area in front of the restaurant. They look like they're probably your age. You should go say hi and introduce yourself. I won't even be offended if you ditch me and sit with them. Mom, you know I'm not aggressive enough to do that. But if you really don't want me around, I can wait in the car for you. Just leave me a bottle of water and crack the windows a bit. There are two boys and two girls hanging around outside the front door. They are all wearing blue jeans and button-up shirts. One of the boys has a black cowboy hat. I wonder if they call them cowboy hats down here. They all look, they all look like what I'd expect from the youth of a town like this. My clothes aren't too different. I mean, I wear jeans too, but mine aren't quite so snug, and my shirts aren't quite so tucked in. And I don't think I own any shirts with buttons. I leave that style to my dad. Both of the girls look good. I don't talk to them much or ask them on dates. Girls, that is. But I certainly notice them. Girls in general, I mean. I bet this is some sort of double date anyway. So even if I was socially capable of introducing myself to complete strangers, I don't think it would be proper in this situation. The place looks pretty full. I hope we can get in otherwise. <clears throat> <laughs> All right. Let's start again. <laughs> the place looks pretty full. I hope we can get in. Otherwise, we are both sitting in the car drinking water. That doesn't make any sense, Mom. I know. As we walk around the last car in the row alongside the sidewalk leading to the front door, the kids all look at us. They are smiling, a mix between howdy partner and children of the corn. Hello, how's the food here tonight? Mom excitedly asks the kids. Perfect as always, ma'am. If, if I could do the southern drawl, maybe that would be insulting more or entertaining more or both. Uh, perfect as always, ma'am, cowboy hat responds first and does one of those nods while simultaneously pinching the front rim of his hat and pulling it down and up very slightly. I almost laugh. I never expected to see anyone do that in real life. Yes, Josie makes the best barbecue in Central Texas, maybe even further. Is this your first time having authentic Texas barbecue? This comes from the shorter of the two girls, both blonde and bearing a striking resemblance to one another. I think they must be sisters, this one being the younger of the two. We've had barbecue before, but this is our first time having it in Texas, right, Eric? Mom makes meeting new people look so easy. Dad, too, but I usually struggle with it for some reason. Maybe when I'm older and I'm meeting kids, it'll be easy like this for me. Something to do with peer group intimidation factors, whatever that means. She continues, this is my son, Eric, Eric Sterling. We just moved into town this week. He'll be starting school on Monday. He's a senior this year. Are you all in high school, too? Mom is thorough. I'll give her that, and she knows how to carry out an agenda. She knows I'd never introduce myself to these guys and probably won't be very forward in the introduction department after I get to school, so she's taking the lead. Hi, Eric. The other boy and girl joins the younger sister in this standard greeting. Eric, Mrs. Sterling, nice to meet you. Cowboy hat one-ups them all. He must be the leader of the pack. You girls are beautiful. Eric told me he saw some nice-looking girls when we were at the school yesterday. Mom! The shot causes me to interrupt before I realize what I'm doing, and not just interrupt, but do so in the style of a tantrum-throwing young girl. Embarrassing? 
Only mostly. Well, don't you think they're beautiful? I can't believe it. Why is she doing this? She can't just comment on how polite Cowboy Hat is and get back to the real purpose here. Dinner? My eyes drop to the ground as the blush on my cheek hits core meltdown temperature. My physiological response to embarrassment can stand to the best of them. I look up and notice that even with their, their perfectly tanned faces, I can almost detect a hint of blush on the sisters as well. Yes, I answer. You are both very beautiful. I smile and quickly look away again. <laughs> uh, I wrote for myself in a lot of this. <laughs> it's different. It's very different reading it out loud. Probably, I, I'm going to do my best not to have this kind of interjection in every chapter, but the first, first one I have to get used to. This is weird. This is weird to do this. I've never done this before. I tried one time and it was uncomfortable, so I didn't ever try again. Now I'm going to do my best to push through this. All right, where are we? Yes, awkward. Eric is being awkward, as am I. Just illustrating further uh, the character, I suppose. Um, all right. Here we go. The hatless boy speaks up now. And what about me? It was the kind of well-timed comment that I'd like to be known for making. But often I miss the opportunity, thinking of the punchline just a little too late for the conversation. Of course, you two are equally handsome young men. Mom is happy to have struck, struck up a reciprocal, friendly tone in the conversation. She adds, which is probably why these young ladies are with you this evening. Nah, says Cowboy Hat. Chrissy and Jesse are my sisters. They're stuck with me no matter what I look like. Saturday dinners take place at Josie's. It's kind of like a Cranston rule. Well, I'm glad we are in compliance then. Mom seems ecstatic to hear about the Cranston rule. I'm Trent, by the way, and this here is Michael and, of course, Chrissy and Jesse. The three of us, singling out Chrissy as the fourth, are all seniors. She's a sophomore. Once again, identifying Chrissy. It's a pleasure to meet you all. I hope to see you around sometimes. So you can all come over to the house to see Eric, Mom says. Sure thing, we're usually around. There ain't much to do in Cranston besides work, which do we do a lot of. I suppose I should start calling Cowboy Hat Trent now, but perhaps the window of opportunity for a name change has already passed. I think Cowboy Hat is going to stick, at least until I figure out how this embarrassing introduction moment with my mom is going to play out at school on Monday. I guess we'll go have ourselves some of Central Texas's best barbecue then. Ready, Eric? Yeah. I'm still keeping my eyes anywhere but in contact with the four townies. See you at school, man, says Michael. Nice to meet you, Eric. See you on Monday, Jesse says. I look back and smile as we enter Josie's. See ya. Josie's is rather deceptive. From the outside, it looks like an old stucco dive, but on the inside, it's built like a large log cabin-style lodge. The ceiling is high, so much so that I contemplate running back outside to catch a glimpse of the roof again. I guess I just wasn't paying attention to that on the way in. I better not mention this to Mom, or she'll say something like, Of course you weren't paying attention to the building. How could you with Chrissy and Jesse in the way? The whole interior is raw lumber. Well, I guess it was processed somehow, but it looks like logs is what I mean. The walls are covered with paintings and other framed items. Some look like legal documents. Some are old photos, black and white at one point probably, but now more of a faded yellow. As one would expect, there are various animal heads mounted around, and a few sun-bleached bull skulls. Welcome to Josie's. Two newcomers for dinner tonight. We are greeted by a woman roughly the same age as my mom. If I had to guess, <coughs> I'm butchering the punctuation. Welcome to Josie's, exclamation point. Two newcomers for dinner tonight? Question mark. <laughs> Continuing. <laughs> then I mess up a comma. We are greeted by a woman, roughly the same age as my mom, if I had to guess, with deeper lines in her face, most likely from the sun and lots of smiling. She wasn't holding back on the smiling here in the least. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, two newcomers for dinner, replies mom, both excited for what we've heard is the best barbecue in Central Texas. The waitress leans her head back into the side and then shouts, who's got the best barbecue? Let's have one of these. Who's got the best barbecue? Like that. See, I'm acting now. To which the whole crowd inside erupts in a loud, unsynchronized wave of Josie's, Josie's, Josie's. That's good, huh? I bet this waitress used to be a cheerleader, probably at Cranston High. Mom and I are both slightly startled, and Becca, according to her name tag, laughs and explains the pride Cranstonites take in Josie's reputation as being the best barbecue around. Private table, or would you like to join the masses? Becca has the stereotypical appearance and drawl you would expect from a waitress in a small barbecue joint in Central Texas. Exactly that stereotype. I'd be happy to sit with the locals, but I think my son still needs some time to adjust. May we have a table of our own? Mom nudges me in the arm with her elbow and rolls her eyes. Becca laughs and invites us to follow her. As we came in the door, there were some diner-style tables and booths around the right side of the room. On the left were four long banquet tables. The masses, as Becca had called them, filled out nearly every chair at the four long tables. It really does seem like the whole town is here for dinner. This either means the food is worth it, or the town is just that boring. 
I suppose I'll find the answers to both of these questions in short order. The end of chapter one. This is going to be fun. Well, I don't know how to do anything without talking through a whole lot of stuff, so um, this is just the way I do this. I'm looking for a bookmark. I use a piece of paper off of this notepad. Um, all right. Well, so that's Never Trust a Zombie, chapter one. And uh, that was a short, I think, I think the chapters are longer after that. I don't know. But we'll see. Okay, so you get the full experience of an author reading his book 10 years after he wrote it and incredibly uncomfortable to do so. Hopefully that adds to the experience. And if not, buy it and read it yourself. <laughs> Shameless promotion. And then uh, you help me reach my intention of selling 10,000 copies of this book this year, like I said in the explanation video. If you haven't watched that, maybe you want to. Maybe you don't. Um, if you're just here for the story, then stay tuned. The chapter two will come. I am, I'm gonna. There's 19 chapters. Um, each chapter title has significance. I'm not gonna say it again, so you have to be uh, attentive. But let me know what you think the significance is of the titles, and um, I'll send you a book or something. Um, don't don't play the game if you already know. And, um, oh yeah, so 19 chapters. I'll probably do one a week, but I might do more depending on how I feel. And uh, we'll see. All right, so thanks for participating in this fun experiment for me and listening to this chapter. And uh, the, the, it, it does pick up. It becomes more interesting, I think. We'll see. Um, it's going to be fun, though. I'm enjoying it already, so hopefully you are as well. Uh, again, thanks, and I will read to you later. Thank you.